You're now watching Way Back Wednesday. Sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. Good evening, friends, and welcome to another episode of Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcock. Good to have you with us tonight. Um, and carrying on from last week's topic, we were talking about the Tar River and transportation and so forth that took place in the Tar River. I thought it would be neat to go back and look at some of the events that have taken place and, and used to be regular occurrences, in fact, not only in the Tar River and on the banks of the Tar River, but down around the mills, particularly Battle Park and so forth. So I've got some pictures to share with you tonight of some activities and, and events that took place all up and down uh, Tar River. But before we get into that, there was a picture that was sent to me by a viewer a couple, three weeks ago now maybe, and somehow or another I neglected to get it into the bunch to share with you, the viewer, and I wanted to make sure I did that tonight before we got into anything else. And so this is a picture that was sent in to us by uh, Dean Jackson, uh, Dean Mosley Jackson. Some of you know her. Uh, her family owned the uh, Mosley Motel out on 301 for many years, and, and Dean sent me a message saying that she had a picture that she wanted to share with me and thought it would be interesting for her viewers to, to see, and I said, sure, send it on. And so she sent it about three weeks ago, and like I said, it was on my list of pictures to include every week, and somehow I just never made it on my flash drive to bring it to the station. But I've got it tonight, and Lee, if you've, if you've got that, um, those pictures queued up already, go ahead and put that first picture up, item number one. And this is uh, actually a scene from the motel, um, not that one. <laughs> um, it should be a picture of uh, Leon Mosley uh, at the Mosley Motel. Um, and you're in today's date, right? 10, 13, 2021. Uh, the flash drive that I bring Lee each week has a folder for each episode, each week's episode, and I date them uh, by the date that, of the show airs. And so uh, I'm, I'm not sure it might have got on the, the wrong month there, but or wrong date. Uh, but in any case, he'll have it up for us in just a second here. But uh, while we're waiting for Lee to pull that up, um, I wanted just to read something to you here. And this is a little bit of history that I ran across. This was in the Even Telegram uh, in 1955. And um, it's actually a, a column, and I saw it a couple times over the years, um, but it's, he it's subtitled, I'm Thinking, and then the main title of the article says, Recollections of an Old Teacher. Now, the teacher himself is not identified, so I don't know who this quote-unquote old teacher is, but this article appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram uh, in April of 1955, and it talks about the Tar River in 1811. It says, we recently carried an account of Tar River as it was fully described by Jeremiah Battle in an article presented by him to the Edgecombe Agricultural Society. We continue the story as told by the writer and reprinted in 1929 in the North Carolina Historical Review. And it goes on to say, at the comments of the Great Falls is an island containing about 15 acres and is called the Panther Island, from its being formerly the habitation of those animals. There is another island about the termination of this cataract of a smaller size and has been in cultivation. These are the, all the islands worthy to be noticed except those interspersed among the swamps of Canada. Tar River has two bridges, oh, I'm sorry, in the swamps of Canada. Tar River has two bridges in the county. The most considerable one is in Tarboro. It is about 200 yards long, well built, and wide enough for two carriages abreast. It was built by M. Whitaker and cost the county $1,400. Eight miles above that is Teats Bridge, which is also built and supported at the public expense. Teats Bridge was two miles above the mouth of Swift Creek. Twelve miles above Tarboro at Shell Banks, the seat of Joel Battle, another bridge was built at his own expense, but is demolished by a fresh bridge. And then in parentheses it says, it had evidently been rebuilt before Fulton made his survey of the Tar River in 1820. A bridge has lately been built uh, at the Great Falls on the Nash side of the line and is a specimen of the public spirit of that county. So the point of this was, you know, I've, as a child, spent many hours down around Rocky Mount Mills uh, Battle Park, I should say, behind the mills down there, uh, climbing over the rocks and fishing, uh, having a large time on many occasions. I knew there were islands back there, particularly this uh, Panther Island uh, had been all over that. 
I never knew it had a name when I was a kid, climbing all those rocks and spending all that time down there. I never knew that island had a name. Uh, and I wasn't sure in, in later years when I heard it referred to as Panther Island, I wasn't sure how long it had been identified as Panther Island. But according to this, as early as 1811, that island had already been mapped, already been identified as Panther Island. And as the account says here, it was named that because of the panthers that used to inhabit that island. I thought that was kind of interesting that there were, uh, of course, you know, around here we call them mountain lions or cougars, but um, who would ever thought that it was mountain lions slash cougars, panthers, whatever you want to, whatever term you want to use, here in Rocky Mount around the falls down there. But apparently there were, and that's how that island got its name. So anyway, I just thought it was a neat bit of history about the area down there around uh, Battle Park and the falls and all and so forth. So anyway, Lee, have we got our pictures together yet? <laughs> He's bringing me a note. Bear with me. What does this say here? Uh, you're not seeing a, a photo with today's date. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, I may have misnamed it. That's possible. Um, well, I'm going to, bear with me folks, take this and see if you can find those. It's possible I just named it wrong, with the wrong date on there. Okay, so anyway, while Lee is trying to find our pictures, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the, the Battle Park area itself down there. Um, you know, as I said, I spent many hours down there as a kid and uh, used to fish down there and uh, swim. Um, I didn't realize that there were so many other activities that had taken place so many years before I came along. There was actually uh, what I have since found out for several years back, and we'll show you some pictures here when we get all this to sort it out, but for several years there were actually Boy Scout camperies that took place down there and they camped on Panther Island. Um, there used to be a bridge in fact. Oh, we got a call. Let's get this call. Hello caller, you're on the air. Yeah, Randy, have you been notified? Uh Sudden link, some y'all y'all screen is black. I uh, have not, but thank you. Can you hear the audio? No, I can't hear any sound or anything. It's just a black screen and no sound or anything. Okay, I'm sure glad you let me know, and we will check into that immediately. Okay, thank you. Right, thanks for calling. Okay, uh, Lee, did you catch that? I got another caller coming. Let me get this call here too. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Yes, uh, I'm having a problem out here on Halifax Road. Uh, Are you a Sudden Link customer? A what? A Sudden Link? You get your uh, t television over Sudden Link? Oh, yes. And uh, I just want to let you know that your program is on a freeze frame. There's no audio and no motion. Yep, we but, uh, just had another caller call and tell us the same thing. I'm not sure what's going on. We're looking into it now. It, it may be something going on within Sudden Link's equipment. Um, okay, well... We enjoy the program, so if you can fix it, please do. We was, we're working on it right now. Thanks for calling in. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, got another call. Let's get this call. Yeah, Hello, caller. You're on the air. Hello. Whoop, I think we lost him. Okay. Um, Lee, are you seeing an outgoing feed? Keep calling in now. Okay. All right, I do apologize, folks. We seem to be having some technical difficulties. We're not sure right now whether it is uh, our uh, equipment here or within Sunlink or something else. We're, we're looking into it to see if we can determine what's going on. I do apologize. Um, if you can get the signal, if you're able to watch us, give us a call and let us know. 407 11 is a number. I just want to know if we're getting out at all. So if you're able to, to see uh, the image and, and hear audio and so forth, Give us a call and let us know. Uh, we may have more problems than we were aware of. Um, in any case, until we hear otherwise, we'll keep going with the assumption that we're on in some degree. So I was talking about Panther Island and, and spending time down there. Um, as I said, I was not aware that there was a bridge at one point uh, going out to the island uh, in 1949, I think it was. And we've got, I've got pictures of that bridge and we've got some information to share with you uh, if we can get it all together here. But there was actually a, um, a, a bridge that was deemed to be unsafe. And because it was deemed to be unsafe, the bridge was torn down. I think it was 1949. And so with that being the case, um, it was never rebuilt. So there, there's no bridge now and has not been since that one was torn down. And so uh, 
But in addition to the bridge going out to the island, there was also a stage out there, I understand. We've got a picture somewhere of, of a stage where there were performances that took place out there. There were bands that would go out there and set up and play. Uh, they had plays out there, in fact. And so it was just a, there was a lot of activity out there on Panther Island that we just didn't, that I didn't know about. And uh, I found out quite a bit of things about that I was not aware of. So I'll tell you what. Um, Let's take, let's, take, let's take a quick break and see if we can nail down, first of all, our pictures, and secondly, what's going on with our signal. I'm not sure we're getting at it all. So folks, bear with us. We're obviously dealing with some technical difficulties here, and we're not sure where they're emanating from, but we'll try to nail them down and get it squared away. Uh, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitations and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. And we're back, we're back. Okay, folks, it's been a madhouse around here for the last three or four minutes, but I think we've got some things resolved. I do apologize. Uh, computers are quirky things, as you all know, and apparently I had a hiccup with a computer. It has since been rebooted. It's come back up. I think we're on the air now. 407-1111 is a number. If you're still not getting us, give us a call. If you've got problems, freezing screen, black screen, no audio, no video, any of that, give us a call. And we'll try to work through the rest of the night's show without any problems, hopefully. So, I'm not sure where, I know we were talking about the Tar River and Battle Park and the area down there. Um, Leah's getting our pictures queued up as we speak. You got them? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to picture number one. This is um, Moses Motel, uh, I guess, uh, here you go, fall scene from uh, roughly 1960s, I think, was a caption on the picture, uh, or at least what uh, D Dean had sent me. But this is Mr. Mosey out front of the motel there. I think that's 301. I kind of out to behind the picture there. And a uh, neat fall scene there with the pumpkins and the corn stalks and the axe in a tree stump <laughs> uh, brought back a lot of memories to me I used to be a neat thing we would do too is decorate our yard and, and so forth for fall and this time of the year and so it was neat to see this picture okay we got a call let's get this call hello caller you're on the air well there's not anything going on on there Randy this is Eric Dawson and uh, about three minutes after you started being on the air with picture and with audio it went to a black screen and this that and the other so there's a, there's a very uh, noticeable situation going on. Oh, it's goodness. 15 minutes after the hour and about four or five minutes after the hour is when the interruption came in and it's not come back. Okay. Well, I thank you for calling. Let me know. We we thought we had. We rebooted the piece of equipment. It, it must be something else going on, but we rebooted one, hoping that would get it, uh, a signal going out. But you say it's still no outgoing signal. 
It ain't nothing but a black screen. And you got, uh, just to clarify, you're on Suddenlink cable TV, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And I, and, and, and I have in one of my TVs, what they have is their digital package, which has a box, and then my television in the other room is not on that digital box, but in both cases, there is nothing there but a black screen with no audio. Okay. All right. All right, buddy. Thanks for letting us know. Thank Goodbye. you. Oh, bye bye. Okay, apparently we're still having problems, and honestly, at this point, I don't know. Um, I understand we had a call during the break that said they were able to get us on the internet, so um, hopefully that is still an outgoing signal. So for the time being, we'll assume that that is. Uh, I honestly do not know at this point. Since the, the signal is going over the internet, it looks like. Over there. We are? Okay, Lee's just telling me that we're going out over the air. We've got a monitoring uh, com uh, TV back in the uh, control room that monitors the outgoing signal over the air. So we're going out over the air. It looks like we're going out over uh, the internet as well. And so those that are trying to watch over Suddenlink apparently are not getting us. And this may be a Suddenlink issue. I'm, I'm really just not sure at this point. But in any case, we'll go. On, we'll move on, and um, hopefully, whatever's going on will will resolve itself. Um, we'll try to get word to someone. Maybe they can call Suddenlink and, and check into Suddenlink's uh, operation over there. Okay, let's go down to picture number two. I mentioned earlier about some of the events that took place down at Battle Park. This is actually a photograph, and it's undated. It looks to me perhaps maybe in the 1920s. I've seen this picture before. In fact, we've showed it on the show before. Oh, okay. I just was told Lee said Suddenlink has come back online now. So. Those who are watching the show or trying to watch the show over Suddenlink, you may have a picture now. Um, if you do, call, let us know. 407 1111 is the number. This picture, as I said, we've shown it before. Um, it's captioned Photo of Dance at Battle Park. And as you can see, there's a stage there, and these uh, ladies up there and gentlemen are up there on the stage dancing. And I, I was under the impression that this was on the Tar River at Sunset Park. Um, but obviously, this picture is captioned anyway. Uh, at Battle Park, so I'm not exactly sure where at Battle Park this is. Uh, it could be over on the US 64 bypass side. Okay, we got a call. Let's get this caller. Hello, caller. You on the air? Yes, sir, Randy. This is Randy again. Uh, it's yeah. The picture just popped on. Uh, you're on Sudden Link? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Yeah, I was the one called earlier that it was gone, but it's back on now. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks for calling. Let us know. I appreciate that. I right, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well, welcome to all you Suddenlink viewers. I'm sorry we halfway through the show and just getting you on board with us. Um, you haven't missed an awful lot. We've had difficulties from the beginning tonight, so I apologize for the for the interruptions. Um, we got a bit of a late start, obviously. We've had to restart a couple of things around here, and we still do not know whether the problem was something here in the studio or at Suddenlink. Um, but we've rebooted our stuff here, and hopefully it'll stay up now. So anyway. This picture again, dance at Battle Park on a stage. Uh, I'm guessing it could be down there, maybe somewhere in the vicinity of, of Bob Melton's from there back toward the falls. I'm not sure, honestly. It, it wasn't captured any more than what you see on the screen there. So anyway, Lee, let's go ahead to the third picture here. And this, I mentioned the bridge earlier. This is the only picture I've seen um, of the pedestrian bridge at Battle Park going out to um, Panther Island. And I don't, I don't recall ever seeing those, those concrete or, or um, I'm not sure if they're concrete block um, or some kind of stonework. I'm guessing stonework, frankly. But in any case, I don't recall ever seeing any of this during my time down there. Uh, I understand that this bridge was removed in 1946. In fact, Lee, let's go to the next picture, if you would. The next picture is actually a newspaper article from July of 1946. And it says, the bridge which spans the Tar River in Battle Park from the main section to the small island is being removed with the raising of the bridge beginning today. The announcement was made by officials of the Rocky Mount Mills, owners of the property, who declared that the condition of the bridge was making it too dangerous for use. High waters last year, officials said, began the undermining. The work is being done by Alec Rawls Wrecking Company. Who remembers Alec Rawls Wrecking Company, by the way? Uh, used to be down on South Church Street. That was a name I hadn't heard in a while. Um, and this article refers to the bridge going out to the small island. I'm not sure if 
if that was a misprint, because I can't imagine them putting a bridge like that out to the small island. I'm almost certain it had to be going out to Panther Island. But in any case, in 1946, July 46, that bridge was taken down, and there was never one put back up again to replace it. So, in any case, all right, Lee, let's go ahead and move along then. Let's go to number, that was, that was number four. Let's go to number five. And this was a, a neat article, and it's a long article. I just printed off this to kind of get the headline. And I'll read a little bit of this. This was from um, the Rocky Mount Telegram in June of 1969. And you see the headline. It says, 50th anniversary of pageant was observed here last week. And so the article goes on to say, June 5th marked the 50th anniversary of one of Rocky Mount's biggest events of 1919. And many citizens today remember it from their youth. It was our heritage, a pageant of local history comprising the counties of Nash and Edgecombe. It was performed on a wooden stage on Panther Island behind Rocky Mount Mills on June the 5th, 1919 at 5.50 p.m. It might be considered corny, a remnant of the Higgins, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> a remnant of days gone by. Um, and it's a long walk, I'm not gonna try to read the whole thing, but in essence, it was uh, the play, the pageant that was held was about the history of Rocky Mount, uh, Nash and Edgecombe counties, and again, it was held in uh, 1919, and it was actually held on a stage out on Panther Island. So again, there was a lot of events that took place out there on the island, and apparently at one time, it was much more developed than I ever remember seeing it being as a child going down there uh, back in the 1960s and 70s. So anyway, okay, let's go ahead then lead to the next picture, um, item number six is a girls day I mean I'm a day camp for girls and this is a not a great picture I do apologize this come out of the telegram too this is from 1941 June of 1941 and basically the caption I'll read that to you it says plans are being made for the opening of the day camp at Battle Park on July 1st the camp is sponsored by the Girl Scouts and the City Recreation Department registration will close Saturday the camp is open for all girls between 7 and 18 years of age Shown in the picture, left to right, are Robbie Arrington, Winky Stokes, and Winky Harris. So anyway, um, again, it's another event that took place down there at, the, at Battle Park. And I saw references I mentioned earlier about the Boy Scouts. I think, Lee, let's go to the next picture because the next picture uh, talks a little more about the, the Boy Scouts and, and, and their um, camporees. Now this particular picture here is dated from uh, May of 1937, and this gentleman here, Mr. James, Dr. James West, um, was heading up the Boy Scout Camporee that took place down there. But um, I wanted to read a little article here too about the Camporee from 1937, and it was called the Eagle Trail. Uh, it says, Scouts, you just as well get used to the word Camporee because it's going to be used a lot between now and April 30th. The editor went to the first of a series of district meetings Friday, which started at 4 o'clock at the Chamber of Commerce and ended at 9 o'clock at the Court of Honor, and the Camporee was mentioned often at each meeting, uh, more often at each meeting than any other uh, event. The biggest thing the district executive committee had to do was to select the site. And here's real news because the site hasn't been mentioned in public before. The site will be in the Cradle of Rocky Mount Battle Park down by the falls over on Panther Island where the roar of the falls will tuck you to sleep at night and the noise of the birds will get you up in the morning. So in 1937, and I'm not sure how soon, how many years prior to 1937, but from 1937 onward, I found several years of references to Boy Scouts holding campouts and camping trips out on Panther Island down there at Battle Park. And so it just kind of it makes me wonder um, how much development there was down there. You gotta consider, I saw one article that said there was 300 Boy Scouts that would go down there and camp on Panther Island. So 300 Scouts, you figure roughly two, maybe three kids to a tent. That's an awful lot of tent that had to be set up. It's a pretty good size island, I think 13 or 14 acres as I recall reading. But still there was a lot of, you know, to pitch that many tents um, there had to be a fair amount of, if not smooth ground, certainly cleared ground uh, for these guys could put their tents up and, and have a camp out out there. So that was 1937. Let's go to the next picture if we could, Lee. 
And this next one is actually the article I just read. You can go ahead on past that. Um, I forgot I hadn't included that in there in the pictures. And this is a picture of some of the Boy Scouts. This picture is from actually from 1945 right here. And these uh, young fellows are identified. Um, I'll see if I can read some of these names here. It says, um, uh, the staff of the Boy Scout Camp Free is shown here gathering around Chief Judge Tom Newbold. Uh, the Camp Free got underway yesterday. The, by the way, this was in May of 1945. And it said, shown kneeling left to right, E.B. Strange, Troop 8, Archie Mathis, Troop 7, Judge Newbold, Dick Fountain, Troop 7, Frank Meadows Jr., Troop 12, uh, 13. Um, that's uh, Kip Meadows' dad, by the way. Uh, and Charles Parker, Troop 5. Standing left to right are James Drake, Troop 11, Ray Gray, Troop 7, Ben Richardson, Troop 11, Wesley Smith, Troop 112, and Howard Breedlove, Troop 17. I guess my old troop hadn't been formed. I was in Troop 40 when I was in the Scouts, and that's not even mentioned here, so Troop 40 must have come along many years after this. But again, this is 1945, and this Camp Ray, as I said, was just one of many that was held from 1937 on out there on Panther Island uh, in Battle Park. So just this, this some neat things to know about that area down there that, that I certainly didn't know about. I'm sure some of you may remember that, and some of you probably before your time as well. Okay, Lee, let's go ahead and see the next picture. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what this next one is. Okay, this was something I found interesting here, uh, speaking of things that I was not aware of. Apparently in 1948, they opened up an inspection lane to get your car safety inspected in Battle Park. Now this was on the side that currently faces Highway 64. Um, and if you remember, there used to be a little road that ran on there by the old prison camp. Um, and anyway, somewhere along that road was where this, uh, it was, you see the headlines, at Lane 32 located in Battle Park. And the article goes on to tell a little more about it, and I did not print this one off, and it's too hard for me to, it's kind of blurry, not very good quality. But the neat thing about this was, that same year that they opened up this um, inspection lane out there at Battle Park to get your automobile inspected, Mr. Dick Cadell with Cadell Motors jumped on the bandwagon, and Lee, let's go to the next picture if we could. And this next picture is actually an ad that appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram in May of 1948. And it says, NC uh, State Inspection Lane now open at Battle Park. Let us get your car or truck ready for state inspection. Uh, Cadell Motors, Studebaker Sales and Service, 256 Tarboro Street. So who knew that there was a car, <laughs> a car safety inspection service at Battle Park in the 1940s? I'd never heard that had no idea that anything like that was ever down there. Um, and I'm not sure, honestly, of the exact location in, in my mind. I, I'm thinking it's probably closer, you know, if you think about that side of Battle Park, you've got the old uh, cemetery there, um, and then as you head, you know, east, I guess, through the park there, um, you get to a point where that the pier and all people fish down there. So somewhere between that pier and that cemetery, I'm guessing somewhere in that area there was where this thing must have been. Um, but it was identified as being at Battle Park, so it had to be somewhere in, in fairly close proximity to that. Anyway, all right, so let's go ahead and leave, if we could, Dan, to the next picture. And this was from 1941. I know we're bouncing all around our years here. But as I ran across these pictures, I just kind of, oh, we got a call. Let's get this call. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Randy. Yes, sir. This is G.A. Mars. Hey, G.A., how you doing, buddy? I'm just hanging in there. <laughs> Good to hear from you. Uh, I remember going with my brother out there to have a 34 Ford inspected. Oh, really? In uh, 1948. How about that? So, do you remember precisely where it was, or roughly where it was? Well, yeah. It was, uh, you turn into Battle Park, and, uh, it was set up out there. Because back then, that was a parking place where young people parked on dates. And uh -huh. stuff. Right. And, uh, I just remember going with my brother out there to have his car inspected. 
How about that? And and, <laughs> and you inspect. What kind of car did you have inspected? Thirty four Ford. A Thirty four Ford. How about that? So it um it was. I'm it was in Battle Park. Right. Okay. Okay. That's neat. Okay. I, that, okay. I'll let you go. All right, buddy. Thank you, now. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, I learn something every week on this show, and it's really neat to to find out these things about my hometown that I didn't know. And um, so, anyway, I appreciate the calls and, and the, the memories of you, the viewer, that always makes the show more enjoyable to me from my end, anyway. The picture you see on the screen now is from October 31st of 1941, and I know the picture quality is not too good, but I'm going to read the caption to you because it's, it's an interesting bit of history here, too. It says, some of Rocky Mount's real old-timers lined up in Battle Park yesterday afternoon to inspect a DAR, that's the Daughters of the American Revolution, bronze tablet commemorating the site of the city's first post office. On the extreme left is Mr. L. F. Tillery, former mayor and postmaster of Rocky Mount, and now engaged in writing a history of the city, dating from, it, from its beginning around the rocks in Battle Park by the Falls of Tar River. Next is T. T. Thorpe, another former mayor and also a former state senator from Nash County. Beside the tablet is Mayor J. Q. Robinson, talking uh, to Makaija Petway. I'm sorry talking to Mrs. D. M. Pearsall, chairman of the committee which erected the marker. On the right is Mrs. R. T. Fountain, uh, regent of the uh, Makaija Petaway chapter of the DAR. And this commemorative plaque, um, and I've not been out there to try to locate this. It seems like to me, I, I remember seeing this in years past, um, and I think it was on one of those great big, huge boulders out there, but it was a bronze plaque that um, showed the location of the original post office out there at Battle Park. Uh, I don't know if it's still there, frankly. I, I need to go back out there and look and see because I had forgotten all about, until I saw this, I'd forgotten all about that plaque that was out there. Um, it may still be there. I don't know if anyone's been out there recently and, and seen that plaque. Um, I was out there not too long ago, but I didn't go to that part of the park. I was actually over there by the falls themselves. Um, speaking of which, and I, and I apologize for not bringing those pictures. I took some pictures while I was there. Um, I remember as a child, my grandfather um, telling me, and he he worked 41 years at Rocky Mount Mills. He lived on Spring Street here, my grandmother, and he was just a, a fountain of knowledge about that whole area down there around the Mill Hill and Rocky Mount Mills and so forth. But he told me that there was originally a wooden dam down there, um, kind of inward from where the the stonework and, and concrete dam is today. And so I went down there last week, and I, I'd been there before and seen the remnants of this old wooden dam. Oh, we got a call. Let's get this caller. Hello, caller. You on the air? Randy. Yes. Uh, I was calling about the uh, inspection station in Battle Park. Yes, sir. I remember back when uh, my dad used to carry his car over there. His, he had a 34 Ford also. <laughs> and that was located on one of those little paths that go in into the park. Uh huh. Now, had a cement pad in there. And if I remember correctly, if, if you had a windshield that wouldn't pass inspection, they'd just break it out and keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about that? Well, that's neat. I, that's something I never knew about. I never knew there had been anything like that anywhere near Battle Park, and certainly not in the park. So, uh, that, that's neat. Okay. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. All right. We'll see you. I, I just realized we've been the whole show because we went the first 10 minutes without a show. So I reckon we'll take a commercial break and get some word in from our sponsors. So, Lee, let's go ahead and, and go to our commercials. And um, folks, don't go anywhere. I think we're back up and running now. And so stay with us. Uh, we'll be right back after these words from our sponsors uh, with more Way Back Wednesday.
I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitations and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. And we're back, we're back. Folks, we've had a bit of a rough start to tonight's show. We've had to bump and grind and uh, kick a few tires and light a few fires back there in the control room, but I think Lee got whatever's going on our end straight now. I think there may have been some issues outside the station uh, perhaps with Suddenlink stuff, and I think they've got their stuff resolved too. So, uh, for those that uh, hung around through <laughs> through all of that, and if you didn't, I couldn't blame you. But those who hung around through all that, we're glad to have you with us. We appreciate you bearing with us, and we sincerely apologize for the the chaos that ensued from the beginning. I understand we had about three or four minutes of a broadcast at the beginning of the show, and then everything just kind of went to pot to use an old saying. <laughs> so, anyway, from what I understand, we're up. Uh, if you're not able to to get a good signal, give us a call 407 11 11 is the number on your screen there um, we've been talking about uh, Tar River and Battle Park and some of the things that went on down there over the years and it's a shame that there was so many different types of events and, and activities and, and and reasons to go down there and it was all free other than paying for the, the car inspected um, but you know there was just a lot of lot of activity and you know the same could be said for all over Rocky Mountain there was, just, there was a lot of events over the years that have kind of gone by the wayside and just are not around anymore and that's a shame because uh, I've heard people who are older than I am talk about some of the things I used to do for fun around Rocky Mount um, and it was just a, it seemed to me to be an awful lot of things that you could do for fun for free and sadly those days are unfortunately long long gone so anyway uh, let's get back to our pictures uh, the next picture is from 1976 it's not a very old picture but at least you would um, there's the post office um, commemorative plaque uh, that took place in, I think I said 1941. Uh, okay, so the next picture is actually when Battle Park was dedicated. Now, this is kind of unusual because, as I mentioned earlier, way back in the 1800s, early 1800s, Panther Island was identified, uh, what was then referred to as the Great Falls of Rocky Mount was uh, well-known, well-established community, uh, thriving little community around that area down there. Uh, the Tuscarora Indians uh, certainly were probably still in the area. Um, but it was not until 1976 that the city of Rocky Mount officially dedicated Battle Park. Um, and there was a, a few years there where there was a lot of things that were happening. In 1976, the city formally dedicated Battle Park and that plaque, I, it's a little bit difficult to read, um, and I, I did not print off. Lee, can you zoom in on that just for a minute? I just want to kind of see if we can get a little better, because I did read it um, earlier, but honestly, I, right now, it's just a little bit too difficult for me to read at this distance. I'm sitting across from it here in the, in the station, in the studio, um, and it may not zoom. If it don't, don't worry about it. Um, but in any case, 
what I was getting at was the 76, a dedicated, uh, City Rocky Mount dedicated battle park. In 1977, the very next year, here we go, um, says the land for this magnificent historic park at the falls of the Tar River is a gift from Rocky Mount Mills to the city of Rocky Mount for its citizens and guests who enjoy uh, the natural beauty and recreational opportunities. Scroll up, if you would, Lee, let's look at these names. You see the mayor there, Frederick Turnage, um, longtime Rocky Mount mayor. And then the city council is listed beneath him, uh, Linda Holmes, uh, Joe Warner Jr., uh, George W. Dudley, uh, Walter T. Mears, um, Willa Broughton, uh, Clarence Caps. I used to run Caps groceries down there on Falls Road, and Ernest Bridges Jr. So, um, like I said, this was in 1976. Well, in 1977, the very next year, um, the uh, Confederate monument down at the Falls was rededicated. And it was rededicated to the veterans of all wars. Um, I, I think that was you know, probably an attempt to hopefully um, remove some of the negative stigma attached to the, the monument. Um, sadly, it doesn't appear to have worked. But in any case, there was, a, I think, an, uh, a genuine uh, earnest effort to, to, to make the, the monument more you know, appealing and more acceptable, maybe uh, is a better word, for more people. And so in 1977, the city of Rocky Mount formally rededicated Confederate monument to the veterans of all wars. And to this day, that, has, that designation has never been taken away, even though the monument itself has been taken down and, and moved on. So there's a little bit of neat history there about the park and the monument and the dedication of both the park and the Confederate monument. Let's go ahead and lead you to the next picture then, if we could. Um, this is actually from uh, a Nash County Travel and Tourism brochure I found. On the extreme far left of the picture there, um, you can see Battle Park and you see the island there um, that is Panther Island. Number 19, I think, is the designation in a little orange circle with the, with the number 19 in it. That island is Panther Island. And so you see where US 64 bypass is out there. Uh, you see the boat ramp there, and so somewhere between that boat ramp and the entrance to the Battle Park is where that uh, North Carolina Safety Inspection Place would have been located inside Battle Park there, from what I'm gathering from the calls we've called in. But anyway, this was, uh, this was done by the Nash County Travel and Tourism Board, and so, like I said, it's a little, neat little map showing the area, uh, Tar River and Battle Park and so forth. And leave the next picture, if you would, let's take, pull that one up. Um, this is actually from the, uh, an excerpt from the Rocky Mount Trails, which is um, that uh, walking trail that starts over uh, by Tom Steth Park and goes across the river and, oh gee, I forgot how many miles this thing is, it goes and, and winds on and on. Uh, but you can see in this picture here too, um, over on the right hand side of your screen there, you see where, and it's kind of the lower right hand corner there, you see where the it's hard to make out, but there's the falls is listed there, and then the, I think it's the number seven in this picture. That little island uh, was the number seven in the middle of it. That is Panther Island. And so, um, as I said, I knew as a child that island was there and, and spent time all, all around that area down there. Um, but I never, in my memory, I just it's hard for me to imagine there being enough cleared area on that island for 300 Boy Scouts, for example, to camp out, or for there to be a stage out there for people to perform on, uh, or a, a bridge that you could go out there to the island. Um, those are all things that have just fascinated me because I've never heard anything about any of that before. So, okay. All right, let's go down to the next picture. And this is one that uh, I wish the quality of the picture was a little better. Um, this was actually in 1943 was when this uh, article came out in the Rocky Mount Telegram. And I'll read the caption to you because this is, this is some really neat history here about Rocky Mount. It says, um, picture made in 1903, the first automobile in Rocky Mount. Owned by the late Spencer K. Fountain, it was driven by his son, Louis K. Fountain, to the falls and at a point on the west bank of the river near where is now the entrance to Battle Park from the river bridge, it was turned around and Mr. Scott Holman, present foreman of the Roundhouse, 
of the Atlantic Coastline Railroad takes a position under the wheel in a driver's seat while the late Pete Christian sits alongside and together they are photographed while Mr. Christian is attempting to get his bird dog into the picture from the back seat. The, this automobile is recalled by many of the local residents and is very characteristic of the touring cars of the earlier days which followed the model of the buggies and uh, I can't make out this last word, it looks like photons. A typical photon construction, this one was entered to the door above the two rear wheels that admitted passengers for the back seats. The photograph represents the efforts of Lewis K. Fountain and its publication is through his courtesy. Spencer K. Fountain, um, if you if you go, he was actually I think a mayor of Rocky Mountain at one time. He was um, very instrumental. He was um, uh, kind of a jack of all trades. Um, uh, very influential in Rocky Mountain. He's a member of the uh, Twin County Hall of Fame. He's got a plaque on the wall. His picture's on the city hall wall up there. I've seen before. But um, anyway, the, you know, first automobile in Rocky Mount, 1903 was the year. And by this time, by the time this picture had been taken, um, Mr. Spencer K. Fountain himself was deceased. And therefore, his son, Louis K. Fountain, actually brought the car out and, um, and they took a drive down Falls Road, as you said, as I read earlier, down to the falls, a battle of the mill, and then turned around and drove back. But in any case, neat piece of history there. Um, this article appeared and the picture appeared in the Telegram in 1943, um, but the picture itself was actually made in 1903. Okay, all right, Lee, so let's go then to the next picture. And you know, I love looking at old newspaper ads. Uh, this is from 1938, and it says, Bullock Auto Sales Company will present the new 1938 Chevrolet Parade Wednesday at 2 p.m., in which the lovely girls of Waikiki Nights will ride in native Hawaiian costumes. Don't fail to see them. Choose Chevrolet, America's complete low-priced car with perfected hydraulic brakes and genuine knee action riding comfort. And over on the right hand side of the screen there is a little bit it says um, Wednesday March 16th only Center Theater will present a lovely bevy of Hollywood starlets in Waikiki Nights spectacular stage review featuring 40 entertainers in person. Um, I can imagine this raised a few eyebrows in 1938 when these scantily clad young ladies um, were dancing across the stage in the center theater, but sadly, I hate I missed that. In any case, before my time, obviously, 1938, Bullock Auto Sales, uh, later uh, Don Bullock Chevrolet, of course, um, over on uh, 115, 117, 119 South Church Street, uh, which is now the location of the uh, arts, uh, I forgot what you call it now, Art Center, I guess. Okay, Lee, so let's go to the next picture. Uh, I mentioned I love these old ads, and this is a neat one here to me, too. This is from 1945, and it's an ad from Standard Electric. Now, when I got out of the Navy in 1986, I went to work um, for, a, uh, for Standard Electric in a division they had at that time called Standard Electronics. Um, Mr. Uh, Lionel Bynum was still... Uh, still around then and still in charge of everything. But Standard Electronics um, was the division I went to work for and we were uh, tasked with installing security systems, burglar alarms, fire alarms, etc. cetera. Um, kind of a sideline to that was telecommunications and, and I was assigned to that branch. And so we did, for example, we did cabling work, both uh, telephone and computer cabling for Hardy's food systems. Um, certainly for other businesses too around Rocky Mount, Hardy's was the number one customer. But at that time, Standard Electronics was more of an electrical maintenance company when I worked for Standard Electronics. And in fact, uh, we kind of consider ourselves as two different companies all owned by the same people, but Standard Electronics did the cabling for computers and telephone equipment and so forth. Standard Electric was more of a traditional electrician service. But this ad really kind of, zoom in on that if you would, Lee. I want to kind of share some of, of what they offer here because it, the article says it's back. The famous Bendix Automatic Home Laundry is now on display in our showroom. Come in and see it. And so um, 
it's a little bit blurry from here, Lee. Can, is, is, can you zoom in on that a little bit? We'll see. Oh, there you go. Now scroll down a bit so we can get to item number one. Okay. All right. It says, come in and see it. It fills itself with water. It washes clothes. Then it triple rinses. Item number four says, it damp dries them. Okay, Lee, you can scroll up now. And then it says, number five, it empties itself, and then number six, it cleans itself, and number seven, shuts itself off, all automatically. Come in, talk it over, get your name on our first to be served list. So I never knew Standard Electric sold washing machines. Um, I worked for this company for about a year back in the 1980s when I first came out of the military. And um, like I said, I was working for the Standard Electronics Division, but I, you know, we kind of, uh, we shared some common interests with the Standard Electric part of the company also. Uh, but back then, they were pretty much industrial slash commercial you know, electricians and so forth. Um, I never knew that they ever sold washing machines, but apparently uh, in 1945, they did <laughs> for a while. Then we've got time for one more, and this is my favorite one. Lee, this is from 1971, and you can zoom back out now. There you go. This is the Sears Christmas Layaway Big Toy Box Sale, and it's from October the 13th of 1971, 50 years ago today. How about that? Well, you could get your kid a Sears rechargeable doom buggy for $29.88. These things are 300 bucks now, by the way. If you can find one, they're $300. Uh, or you could get a Tyco double H, uh, H, H O scale road race set for $13.88. I think I had one of those, actually, probably uh, sometime around this time of year, 19, like late 60s, early 70s. I, think I, I know I had one. I don't know if it's this exact one or not. But quite often, our Christmas did come from Sears. And, um, and so when I saw this ad, it really brought back some, some fond memories for me. And uh, it's just a shame we don't have a Sears in Rockman anymore. I love that store. I always did. So anyway, Lee, bring it back to me. Folks, we run slam out of time. I wish we had more time to, with you tonight. But um, I'm so glad we were able to, to have you with us. And again, I apologize for the technical glitches that we had at the beginning of the show. We still don't know, honestly, whether... Uh, it was here in the studio or outside that was causing the problem. We rebooted everything just to kind of rule out a problem here. Um, whether that fixed anything or not, we don't know. It's possible it did. Um, it looks like there may have been something going on with sudden links um, on their end, and they apparently resolved their own issues. So maybe next week we'll have a better outcome. So thank you all for hanging with us there. We really appreciate your, your viewership and your continued support. Folks, have yourselves a great week. Take care of yourselves and be kind to each other. We'll see you next week with more Way Back Wednesday. Good night.